Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us for this next episode of Prop Talk Live. Uh, today we'll be talking about boating safety, and safety is something that should be on every boater's mind every time they go out on the water. And we have two very special guests today. So we have Ted Sensenbrenner from the Boat US Foundation and Christine Plummer from Towboat US. There's, thank you guys so much for joining us. No problem, Kaylee. Thanks for having us. <laughs> hey, um, so Ted, can you tell us um, how long have you been with Boat US? I've been with Boat US for 20 years. I started uh, at our headquarters location in Virginia and uh, I was brought aboard to do primarily boat shows. And then over the years, I found my niche in the boating safety department, which is the Boat US Foundation for Boating Safety, which is now headquartered in Annapolis, Maryland. So I've been with the foundation for 10 years, but a total of 20 at Boat US. And uh, Christine, so you were with uh, Towboat US Annapolis, correct? Yep, so my husband uh, purchased Towboat US Baltimore Middle River back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then we expanded to Towboat US Annapolis in 2015, Towboat US Herring Bay in 2017. Um, so we've been doing this now for 10 years um, and we've pretty much seen it, done it, gotten the t-shirt. It's been, it's been an interesting 10 years. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have some really good stories and we will definitely get to those tonight. Um, but the first thing I wanted to touch on, um, and maybe you can help us with this, Ted. Um, so I know there's a difference between required safety items and recommended items. Could you tell us a little bit about required safety items that voters should have on board? Uh, sure. Well, that's a great place to start. The The Coast Guard actually publishes a, uh, a guide called the Boater's Guide to the Federal Requirements for Recreational Boats, and it outlines the items that would be checked if you were to be boarded or uh, an officer were to come alongside and they're looking to see if you have the required safety equipment aboard. They might have some recommendations as well. I think the first thing that the law enforcement typically looks for are life jackets. It, it's such a basic requirement. I hope everyone knows they need to have a life jacket aboard for each person and then it needs to be properly fitting. So that means if you have four adults and two children, you can't have six adult life jackets. The children have to have uh, properly fitted life jackets. And in some cases, uh, they'll need to be wearing those life jackets depending on the length of boat and their age. So a uh, life jackets is a requirement. Um, the life jackets uh, are, 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 are often known as types, type one, type two, type three, type four, type five. Uh, those types, uh, incidentally, are, are, are actually going to be going away. The Coast Guard was hoping to cut down on some confusion as to what the different types meant. The Coast Guard now would like for, for, for boaters to think of life jackets as either wearable or throwable. Um, obviously, you're not going to wear a throwable, but there is a requirement that you have to have life jackets that you wear that um, may not be a requirement to wear it, but you have to be fitted so that you could wear it. And then at least one device that you could throw if your boat's longer than 16 feet. And that would be what we think of as a, a seat cushion, but a throwable device. It could be a horseshoe uh, throwable or a, or a ring buoy uh, as well. So you have to have life jackets aboard for all. The second thing that's required is um, our visual distress signals. That's what most people think of uh, as flares. Uh, you have to have uh, devices that can be seen at, uh, during the day and night. So a good combination flare is, is perfect for the bay. Um, if you're boating after night, you want to make sure you know where your flares are and your emergency signaling equipment are. And, uh, and, and flares do expire. I'm not sure if it'll come across on the, the, the monitor here, but there's an expiration date and a born on date. In this case, it was made on uh, May 2017 and expires October 2020. So they expire every 42 months. Essentially, every three boating seasons, you're going to have to purchase new visual distress signals. Um, there are new devices that are uh, non-pyrotechnic. They are essentially a strobing light, and that's a good alternative for visual distress signals. Uh, 
Third, third requirement for most boats, uh, certainly most boats with engines would be fire extinguishers. Uh, the requirements vary depending on the length of the vessel. Uh, remember, these are Coast Guard minimums. So if you read up on what's required, uh, the Coast Guard might say that only one fire extinguisher is required, but we always uh, encourage people to plus up. Uh, buy a second fire extinguisher and make sure it's mounted somewhere where you can grab it uh, in an emergency. Um, the fourth piece that's required uh, would be a sound producing device. Uh, that's either a horn or a whistle. Some way to signal uh, that your presence, uh, in some cases to signal your intent, whether that is a, a changing course or a passing scenario but you need to have some sort of sound producing device and it has to be audible for at least a half a mile. And uh, the last thing that's required would be navigation lights um, if you're going to be operating after, after dark. Uh, there may be other required equipment depending on your length of vessel. Uh, usually boats that are over a certain length, such as 65 feet, boats that are commercial or for hire, they've got much more uh, extensive requirements in terms of, of equipment that must be, must be aboard. But uh, to simplify what's required, life jackets, visual distress signals, a sound producing device, fire extinguisher, and nav lights. Uh, the list of recommended equipment is, is much, much longer, and you can kind of develop your own list based on what kind of boating you're doing. I'll run down some of these lists and I uh, some of these things on this list, but I do believe Christine will reinforce many of the items on this list. Uh, a VHF radio or a cell phone, some way to, to call for assistance. Uh, anchor in an anchor line so you can hold your position uh, if you were adrift. Uh, pumps, uh, hopefully there's a working bilge pump in a bucket uh, in, in worst case scenario to help dewater the boat. A smoke detector or a CO detector if you have uh, a living space or a, uh, some space down below for passengers. Charts and a compass, big tools, and um, and your engine cutoff lanyard. Mm -hmm. uh, those top items uh, for uh, for recommended items. They're not required, but they're strongly recommended. Okay. You would not believe how many calls we get every single season where I tell people, it's going to take us 45 minutes to get to you. Please toss out your anchor, make sure it's secure. And they have to fess up that they don't have an anchor on board. And if without an engine, that anchor is the only control that you have over your boat, period. So you've got to be able to have a spare anchor kept on your boat at all times. So if you do have to cut your anchor loose, you have a backup anchor maybe even a backup storm anchor heavier than your original anchor because that's the other thing people get into a lot of trouble during storms that's when they tend to need us the most and those smaller anchors that they keep regularly out when they're picnicking or just stopping for a few minutes won't cut it during a bad storm so having a larger storm anchor or anything to help you out in that stressful situation is a big plus. So an anchor and a spare anchor is my recommendation on that one. Yeah, that's very good advice. And we actually just had um, a couple questions coming, guys. Um, so from Cindy Wallach, what age are children no longer required to wear PFDs while underway? Is there a um, uh, limit? In, in Maryland, can you, can you recite that, Chris? I think it's 12. Yeah, under 13. Under 13. Um, uh, on boats that are 21 feet or under. There you go. And for small children, just make it a plain fact. You don't go on the boat unless you're wearing that life jacket. That was our rule. You don't get on the boat. Sorry, we have to go home today. And one time of going home without getting on the boat, they will wear their life jackets. <laughs> um, as far as kids' life jackets that are comfortable, try to get as, as make them as comfortable and non-restrictive as possible. But if you're taking kids out just one or once or twice a year, Boat US Foundation has the life jacket loaner sites that they can, you can go to these free sites, hand over your um, documentation, you know, just your license, 
and they'll lend you life jackets that fit each child that you're taking on the boat with you. And then mm -hmm. at the end of the weekend, you can return those life jackets so the next person can borrow them. There's probably 10, eh, eight different sites around the area. And if there's any commercial marinas that want to become life jacket loaner sites, um, they can do that. It's an easy process and it's free to them. So I really would encourage people to look up the Boat US Foundation's life jacket loaner site so that we, we don't have any children fatalities this year, none. Yeah, that is a really great program. And um, it's like we have another question from Mark Hergen. Um, if either of you guys would like to answer, would you recommend a PLV or a personal AIS? Wow, that's a lot of uh, abbreviations there. Uh, for those that, uh, that don't know, a PLB is a personal locator beacon and an AIS is a, a, an automatic identification system. It's both of these items can be activated to alert someone else, a third party um, uh, of your need for immediate and emergency assistance. This, this is not for, um, I, I, I'm having some engine difficulties. These items would be activated if you find yourself in a dire situation. The question that Mark poses, uh, personal locator beacon or an AIS, um, it kind of depends on, on where you're going and, and, and what you're doing. I would tell you this, if you are boating alone and you're offshore, I would recommend the personal locator beacon. That, when activated, uh, will get to the Coast Guard with your exact location so that the Coast Guard can initiate a search and rescue response. Yep. A personal AIS is also very good. Um, a personal AIS, instead of alerting uh, uh, satellites that are many miles away and initiating a search and rescue response from many miles away, a personal AIS notifies those vessels in the vicinity, typically four to five miles away, that are monitoring AIS or have that ability to, to um, pick up AIS or DSC activations. Often the best search and rescue or the best rescue uh, or best people that can provide a rescue are other boaters that can come to your assistance. In some cases, they might be faster than the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard's coming from you know, a distance far away in a helicopter. Uh, your best chance of rescue could very well be other boaters. And even better, if the boat you were to, uh, went overboard from, if they're monitoring, they will probably be your best chance of rescue. So uh, they're slightly different, slightly different applications. But for the bay, I would say a personal AIS because a lot of people monitor AIS. All the ships that you see anchored out or going up and down the channels have AIS. Uh, they're able to probably get a, a visual on you and direct other agencies to 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 your location. So that's a toss up. Good question, yeah. Mark Hergen. But in 2017, the summer of 2017, there was a gentleman who was sailing by himself and freak storm. He fell overboard. He treaded water for seven hours before Captain Dale and my son, my husband and my son, found him floating off of North Point State Park. And he was okay, but seven hours treading water. If he had had some sort of personal beacon, he would have been found much quicker. The only reason anybody knew he was in trouble is they found the sailboat ashore, all of his personal effects still on board. So. Definitely worth the investment, especially if you're out there by yourself. I know our captains all have them and have them connected to their life jackets. So if something happens to them, we, we are able to track where they are. It's good practice. So, um, Christine, um, following up on that, could you kind of tell us some of the typical calls that you guys respond to? Um, you know, kind of the issues that you maybe see most often? So this weekend, it seemed to be the fuel drop. We did a lot of people running out of gas. Um, so we bring five or 10 gallons out to them whenever they need it. We did a lot of ungroundings whenever the tide is unusually low or someone's not paying attention, they bump onto a sandbar. 
Um, and battery jump starts, they've been out at Dobbins or Hart Miller a little too long, kept the radios going a little too loud, mm -hmm. and then they can't get the boat started. So that usually starts about three o'clock in the afternoon. We start getting those battery jump start calls or first thing on Sunday morning if they've been anchored out all night. Um, <laughs> and then of course, just the, I don't know why it's not working calls. I have no idea how to fix my boat. So come get me and take me back to my dock. So yeah, um, last weekend, our busiest day, um, we were running seven captains all day long. So we saw pretty much every kind of incident last last weekend, including a boat fire, um, the truck and trailer ending up in the water story. It's it just runs the gamut, but the normal ones are the jump starts, battery stuff, the fuel deliveries, and the tow back to their home docks. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so one thing that we often talk about when we're talking about safety is uh, a pre-departure checklist. And I think this kind of touches on a lot of what we've been talking about. But if someone is preparing to go out on their boat for the day, what are you know some things that they should put on this pre-departure checklist to make sure, you know, they're going to have a safe day on the water. And if either of you guys want to chime in. So just based on the experiences that we get on the calls of what they've forgotten, um, they've forgotten the anchor, they've forgotten an extra battery for their cell phone um, mm -hmm. or a charger for their cell phone so that they can keep in touch with us. Um, and I know that lately it's been the people getting dinged for not having enough life jackets on board. So make sure that you have just the basics of, you know, enough life jackets on board because they do check. There's a lot of um, DNR out and checking to make sure that people are going to be safe out there. So it's the life jackets that we've been seeing a lot of. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, would you recommend, let's see, so if someone is going out for the day, um, should they be, you know, letting like a loved one know where they're going, when they're expected to be back, or is that more if they're going on a longer journey? What would you guys recommend? Oh, it's absolutely helpful. I mean, mm -hmm. if you've got five or six people on the boat, it's probably less of an issue. But if it's just you or it's your entire family and nobody's going to know you're gone for days, it might be good to, to tell other people where you're going. It's called filing a float plan. And it's not mm -hmm. it's not just for sailors that go around the world. It's <laughs> every once in a while, every once in a while, a boater is overdue and you'll hear the Coast Guard calling out to them. Um, and they do it bay wide because most likely they don't know where the boater was supposed to be going or where they ended up. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually just had a question come in. Um, does Boat US offer, um, is there like a printable checklist that you could find online um, if someone wanted to know which items they should kind of be thinking about? Sure, we have a, a number of different uh, examples of checklists you can have any number of, of items on there and you can customize it yourself. Uh, the short answer, Paul, uh, is, is that uh, uh, BoatUS.com, if you just type in the search bar uh, pre-departure or checklist, you'll come up with uh, a number of suggested items that you might want to put on your checklist. And again, I would encourage you to, to customize that for your boat um, and, and, and your type of activity. There's all sorts of checklists. A safety checklist is is what Christine mentioned first. Yeah, you need to make sure you have the the required items. Some of those items you'll have to check for expiration dates to make sure they're current. But then there's also a checklist for trailering. So if you're going to trailer your boat to your location, is your trailer and your entire package safe to hit the road? Uh, and then there's a pre-launch checklist. If you're trailing your boat and you end up at a, at a launch, and I didn't hear Christine tell this story, but I know that it's out there that it, it, the number one uh, de device that people are missing uh, is their drain plug, and that will end up in disaster real quick if you don't have your drain plug installed. So those are the items. They say that uh, your memory is, is fallible, but uh, checklists are not. So. Um, having a written checklist or a printed checklist is, is a good thing to have. And the other thing that I do with guests is, 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 a, is a safety briefing. So before you depart, 
let your guests know, especially those that aren't familiar with boating or this, they're new to boating, um, let them know where some of the safety items are and if possible, show them how to use them. So that if, for instance, the, you go overboard or the operator goes overboard, is it possible that your guests that are still left know how to call for assistance? Do they know how to turn the boat around? Do they know how to shut the engines down? And that kind of thing. Great. And, um, and Ted, I know you wanted to um, kind of circle back on life jackets, because um, I know there is a lot to go over with that. And I think you actually have some items to, to show us, an inflatable life jacket. Sure, sure. So Chris mentioned at the beginning um, uh, about the sponsors. Uh, I'm happy to say that I'm not here to sell anything but good, but good ideas. So I'm hoping I'm, I'm doing a good job selling good ideas. I don't sell life jackets, but one of the things we like to sell people on is to, to select a life jacket that you're comfortable in and that you're going to wear or you're going to want to wear. We, we like to say, you know, the best life jacket is a life jacket you'll wear. Um, many people are in the habit of wearing a life jacket all the time. Some people just pull it out when the weather gets rough. Other people wear it when they're boating alone. That's your choice, but there's so many choices of life jackets today that I think the excuses are, are, are gone. They're invalid. You know, they, they're orange, they're bulky, they're hot. Uh, one of my favorites, and I get caught wearing this all the time, it's a belt pack. It's a belt pack inflatable life jacket. It is very common, very popular with stand-up paddle boarders because they're required to have a life jacket. The Coast Guard considers a stand-up paddle board a vessel. Therefore, uh, those people operating stand-up paddle boards or to have a life jacket. Um, if you have an inflatable life jacket, the rule is you have to wear it if that's your only means for flotation. So a bell pack is a favorite of mine. It has the CO2 canister in it that when you pull the cord, it will inflate and you just have to simply pull it over your head. So it comes out like a big horseshoe. You pull it over your head and voila, you're wearing a life jacket. Um, another inflatable life jacket is what we often refer to as a suspenders style. This goes over, over your shoulder. It has the same CO2 mechanism. It has a pull cord to inflate it um, manually. This one is also automatic. So if you hit the water, uh, it senses that you're in the water and will inflate automatically. And you're already wearing it, right? So it's, it's like a suspender style that goes over your head and uh, you buckle it in the front, and if it inflates, you're already wearing it. So in that instance, you know where your life jacket is because it's around your neck. The thing that I wanted to point out is that life jackets need to have, or inflatable life jackets need to have uh, a canister, and that canister needs to be current. And for this particular inflatable, there's a green indicator on the life jacket that tells me it's armed, it's ready to go. So you should be looking at that each time uh, you head out, if you're wearing an inflatable, make sure it's armed and it's properly uh, 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 fitted with the straps that go around your, around your waist as well. And then a final device I just thought I'd mention is that I have a different type of life jacket when I go offshore, and it's quite a bit different than the other two life jackets I showed you. Um, this has other safety features built into it, including uh, a tether so that I can be attached to the boat um, if a particular or, or large wave were to, to come over the bow. So there's life jackets for all different types of activities. I don't want to get bogged down with all the different types and what their uses are. Personally, I have a different life jacket for a, each type of activity. But uh, there are some really good general boating life jackets that will meet most of the requirements, but you do need to look at the label. That's my last thought on life jackets. Read the label to make sure that it's legal or suitable for your activity. And I'll give you one, one example. Um, inflatable life jackets are not allowable for personal watercraft. You have to wear an inherently buoyant life jacket for personal watercraft operation. So, so there are some caveats with life jackets. Just make sure that you're reading the label or the manual before you purchase it. Try it on, find something that's stylish that you're gonna wear and keep it handy if you're, if you're not gonna wear it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all, uh, really good advice. Go ahead, Chris. Absolutely keep that life jacket handy. Better yet, keep it on. Because we have seen several boat accidents over the last couple of years. And it's the same in a car accident as a boat accident. It happens fast. You do not know what's coming. You, one minute you're going, the next minute you are not. And there is no time to find those life jackets underneath the seating or wherever you stored them since last winter. So have everything out, make your guests wear them. We, um, we did a 50 foot sunken boat off of the, uh, near the Francis Scott Key Bridge a couple of years ago. And we brought that 50 foot sea ray up and there was still a lifeboat connected to the back end of it. That's how fast that boat went down. All the people ended up getting saved by the fire department, but that lifeboat was still connected to the back of their vessel. It went down connected to the vessel. They didn't have time to do anything. They just all ended up in the water. So luckily no one died during that. But at night, boating at night, absolutely wear that life jacket because there's a lot of unknowns at night that you, you know, you just, you can't see. You're operating by radar or you're going slow enough that you can hopefully see what's coming at you. But mm -hmm. wear the life jacket because it will save your life. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Christine, when, um, when someone is calling you for a tow, um, when they're having a problem out on the water, um, what should they be doing when they wait for you? But also, what are what information should they have at the ready? If it's you know a stressful situation, I'm sure everyone's frazzled. But how can they best help you guys responding? Um, well, the first thing, absolutely, is anchor your boat before you even call me. Throw out your anchor, get everybody situated and seated in the boat, and then they can call me on the BHF. They can use our app, which is awesome. Um, our app actually, if you preload all your information into the app, like what kind of boat you're on, what your destinations might be, it provides your lat and long when you request a dispatch. So everything's automated. I don't have to struggle to hear you with the wind and the waves in the background and me on the phone going, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, everything's provided. There's very little chance for error when it's all in writing. Um, and within five minutes of getting that dispatch, you're going to hear back from a live captain or a local dispatcher closest for where you are, and they're going to give you an ETA. So the app is great. If you don't have a cell phone on board, you don't have cell coverage, your radio is always awesome because you're uh, transmitting to everyone and in a real emergency a mayday situation you should absolutely do your radio because then local boaters anybody around you can can help but for a simple tow just call towboat us on the radio on channel 16 we'll switch you to 10 we'll take down some of your information and provide an eta as well um, it seems location is the hardest thing for people to figure out when they're calling for a tow, mm -hmm. a lot of them are cruising around and they made a left then a right and then a left and they have no idea where they are. Um, the other day, I, I did the whole eye roll over the phone to a gentleman who said, well, I just can't remember the name of the creek that I'm in. And I, I went into, okay, well, let's try to figure it out. And he said, well, I'm, I'm next to a pier that has a towboat US boat on it. <laughs> and I looked out my window and I waved to him. <laughs> he was in the creek right outside of our office window. So that yeah. one was easy, but they're never they're never that easy. It's uh, mm -hmm. I'm near the red house with the really long pier, and I think I, we turned into the Magathy, but we might have gone a little farther up, so I might be closer to the Bodkin. It, so we've got some we've got some fun ways of helping them find where they are using their cell phones, um, latitude, longitude. If they don't have the app, um, it, so we can you know we can figure it out. But really, before you call, know where you are, um, or admit that you don't know where you are, <laughs> so we can get right to the the basis of figuring it out for you. Um, and then, of course, their membership information. That's always the most helpful having your membership number handy 
uh, keeps us from having to stop and, and look it all up. And having a membership in the first place is always handy. And that way I don't have to ask you for your credit card. Yeah, so that's another thing I know um, a lot of people are probably curious about. So um, could you give us an estimate, a basic show if you're a member versus not a member? Um, okay. Um, so say you're coming out of the Annapolis Harbor mm -hmm. and you break down. You're just barely outside in the mouth of the Severn. You need to go back into the Magathy, just past, say, Deep Creek. Um, that's about nine nautical miles, give or take. That's about two and a half hours worth of service. And as a non-member, that's $750. So as a member, the normal membership price for the whole year is $159. We do new members in this area always at 99. So you can try it out for the first year on a really good rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then you pay nothing except for the cost of fuel that we deliver if you break down. So $20 out of pocket, we bring you the gas, you're on your way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's definitely a faster service when you are a member because it takes a long time for me to explain to people how we figure out the length of toes and how much it costs and then get all of their billing information and their email and everything else. Mm -hmm. versus first, last, membership number, what kind of boat are you on? Okay, we're there. Yeah. Okay, so it really does speed up the whole process um, if they're a member. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good to know. Um, so I know another question um, that we've been hearing a lot lately. So due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, um, what are some extra precautions um, voters should be following just to stay safe or are there extra precautions um, that, you know, your captains are using out on the water? Um, if either of you guys would like to jump in. So general boating, uh, forego the raft ups and the parties on shore until everything is safe again. Um, we forget that there are still germs, even if you're outdoors, if you're too close. And if you're with a group of 20 people, you don't know who might be asymptomatic or what might be out there. So let's forego the raft ups and the big boat parties. Stay quarantined with your family. Take your family out on the boat um, and leave it to that for now. And I'm sure by the end of the summer, they'll loosen up those restrictions. Um, as far as when you are doing a tow, our captains have, I guess, the best social distancing device ever. It's a 600 foot tow line. Um, they can hook up to the boat without ever touching another person. Um, they can toss them a, a throw line um, and, and they hook it up themselves or we can hook up to the, the bow eye of the boat, depending on the size of the boat. And then once we get them back to the dock, we're not doing signatures. So we don't have to pass a pen back and forth. And we're asking the customers to follow the captain's directions really specifically for social distancing. So the typical docking procedure is sit down, stand by. If the captain needs you, he will ask you to do something. But don't get up and put your fingers between the mm -hmm. side of the boat and the, the poles or anything until he asks you to touch something. Because if you push off when he's trying to push the other way, it's going to cause a problem. So they tend to just tell them to you know, stay back as far as they can. Um, and it's, it's worked out really well. Our captains do have the option of wearing masks when they come in closer contact with the um, public, but we're never even close to six feet from the customers unless it's a really mm -hmm. tiny boat. Awesome. We towed a 14 foot boat yesterday, so he might've been a little closer <laughs> with that one. <laughs> Great. Um, so one of my one of my last questions. So a lot of the, the boating that we've been talking about um, is here on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but Ted, we've talked about this before. When someone is preparing to go offshore, what are just some extra, you know, safety precautions, safety items that they want to keep in mind? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and I think I touched on some of those items already. Uh, mm -hmm. Personally, 
heading offshore requires a greater responsibility on your behalf to either self-rescue or maintain uh, a position or maintain um, your wherewithal until you can get proper assistance. Hopefully, we'll go back to Mark's question about an AIS or a PLB or even an EPIRB, which is an emergency position indicating radio beacon. If you are in serious and in, in, in dire need of help, you would activate one of these devices because presumably you're beyond VHF or cell phone range. That's when you would activate these types of items. And assistance is on its way. But we know from experience and average call times that it takes a little bit of time for a helicopter to be deployed or a Coast Guard cutter to be diverted or to send a safe boat to your location that the Coast Guard's operating. Even if it's Thomas Point to the Bay Bridge, it takes a little bit of time. And if you're wearing a life jacket that's keeping you afloat, let's assume the boat is, is, is either sinking or you're off the boat or it's on fire or something of that nature, is, is the life jacket you're wearing gonna keep you afloat? When you're offshore, those response times are greatly increased. And therefore, I choose to wear a, a different type of life jacket when I go offshore. Uh, a life jacket that floats me higher, uh, has more visible colors, and um, has additional straps so it doesn't ride up over my head. So one of the devices I think you should look at closely if you're headed offshore and you do it a lot is to be certain that you have a life jacket that's up to the task for keeping you afloat for a longer period of time than otherwise might be needed if you're boating near coastal or, or inland. And then back to circle back to the PLB, if you don't have a way to signal for some help, um, you're just kind of at the mercy of, of, of someone else passing or waiting for that uh, airplane so you can signal or use a flare. Um, and again, these signaling devices, the requirement's only three devices, but this is an opportunity for you to purchase double that or, or more than double that or by um, devices that are can be seen from a greater distance. So there are some additional items or options for your safety signaling equipment that you should seriously consider if, if you're headed offshore. Yeah, great. Self-sufficiency is the key when you're isolated offshore. So pre-plan, what would I do if something like this happened? If the boat starts to sink, what do I need to look at first? Isolate that leak, find where the water's coming in. I wish Captain Dale was here. He would tell you all the things to do for, you know, to figure out what would you need to do to keep yourself safe offshore and keep that boat from sinking. Um, having a ditch bag with tools in it so you can fix your own problems while you're offshore. Um, and I, I believe, and I'm not still sure, but Ted, doesn't Boat US Foundation still rent sat phones? Uh, we don't rent satellite um, phones, but we rent the satellite beacons, the emergency beacons. So we rent uh, emergency positioning indicating radio beacons, that's e verbs, and we rent personal locator beacons. Okay. You can rent life rafts and cell phones or sat phones from some other organizations, uh, Vane Brothers in Baltimore comes to mind. Um, but there's one theme that um, seems to be common with a number of the devices we pointed out, and that's the word automatic. Um, life rafts, for instance, many will have a, an automatic device that will launch it if it senses water. Uh, some of the life jackets that I demonstrated are automatic inflatable life jackets. An EPIRB, for example, most will have a, a water activated feature, so it will go off and deploy automatically. And the reason for that is that if you're incapacitated or you are going about other tasks to save your vessel, to save your crew, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Your life jacket's on, it's gonna inflate, your EPIRB's uh, already deployed and it's already signaling for help, and you can go about saving 
um, saving your property and your passengers. So anytime you have an opportunity to purchase something that's either manual or automatic, if you're headed offshore, spend the extra couple of dollars and, and purchase the items that deploy automatically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It looks like um, we got one last uh, reader question from Melissa. Um, advice on avoiding a salvage claim due to a tow? Oh, so they're very different animals, especially around here. Um, avoiding a salvage claim due to a tow means just throw out your anchor so that your situation does not deteriorate just because your engine is broken down. So I, I know exactly what Melissa is referring to, the old fashioned pirate, he's going to come out and he's going to tow your boat and then he's going to take it from you um, if you know anything else goes wrong. But truly, a, a tow is a tow until your situation deteriorates and that you're in peril or your boat is actually sinking. So with a membership, a towing membership, they'll cover everything that goes on out there short of a scenario where mommy, my boat is sinking and I want to get off, okay? <laughs> And when it becomes that situation where the boat is sinking and we have to use any additional equipment, then it will flip over to a salvage situation. So that additional equipment is airbags, extra pumps, any kind of rigging to keep it afloat. Um, then that's the responsibility of your hull insurance. So recommending absolutely the best hull insurance that you can get that covers all those kinds of situations. Um, so that you're covered and you have planned for every possibility out there. But a tow is just a tow. So throw out your anchor, take your time, make sure everybody's secure and safe, and then give us a call for a tow and we'll get you home safely. It's a simple, straightforward process. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, for joining us today. This was very informative. And I know we had one commenter who said, you know, this is just so great going into boating season. I know it took a little bit to get started this year, but, um, you know, it's, it's always really good to touch on this stuff. And uh, said, I hope we see, you know, less issues this summer. So, uh, so thank you guys so much for joining us. Let the fun begin. <laughs> Our pleasure. Oh, we can't hear you, Chris. Oh, it's out. <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll come start here in a second. <laughs> He's a great host. <laughs> uh. Oh, wow. Paula, Paula. <laughs> awesome. I think she's the one who won, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm just gonna make a big echo. Thank you guys very much. This was really good. Um, uh, again, I just want to thank both you guys and both you guys Foundation, and uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but um, tune in next week for the Prop Talk Live, and uh, we'll see you there. Thanks for being. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye.